Okay, so uh, I get a call at five o'clock, and Pastor says, uh, "I'm in, uh, I'm in jury duty. Uh, can you have something ready?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure. I'm totally always prepared for uh, anything." Have you guys ever? Do I, yeah, right. <laughs> have you guys ever seen the cartoon Hoodwinked? There's this sing yeah, okay, you know what I'm talking about. There's this singing like um a uh, goat and he's all I was prepared. <laughs> Anyways, you know, um for a lot of us the Bible is something that we it's something that we we want to read. It's just you know, life kind of gets in the way. But for those of us who who finally do, you know, carve out some time in our day and and we and we do read the Bible this day, yes. And uh, But then we come across some verses that we just don't really apply. We just kind of read through them and then uh, move on with the rest of our day. And uh, I just wanted to point to kind of uh, look at a few specific ones that have just been kind of been weighing on me. Um, we're going to be talk about three different uh, areas. Uh, the first one is parenting. Then we'll talk about uh, marriage. And then we'll talk about uh, life in general. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so the first one I want to look at is found in Proverbs, uh, verse, or chapter 15, verse 1. Where am I going here? Proverbs 15, verse 1, and it says this. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, once again, okay, we read that, and it sounds like a good idea. Okay. So I, you know, don't lose your temper. Okay, all right. Kind of makes sense, and we just kind of move on. But then we don't stop and say, okay, how does this apply to the different areas of my life? For instance, how does this apply to parenting? See what I mean? Oftentimes when we parent, we do something like this. I'm the parent, so I don't have to be wise and control myself. I, that, because I'm the parent, that gives me the right to shoot off my mouth and talk stupid and talk down to people and, because I'm the parent. Anything I do is automatically right. But Proverbs says, hey, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And then, just in case you missed it, Paul says in 2 Timothy, don't, don't try and irritate your children. <laughs> this is kind of a lot of what he's talking about here is, as parents, just because we are the parent doesn't mean that we, we should, you know, shoot off our mouth and any time that there's a conflict with our children, just kind of, I'm the parent, that's why. Well, maybe, maybe that is true, but you could still handle it with a little bit more wisdom than that. Um, it, I feel like sometimes we turn off our, our Christian Christianity for some things, you know what I mean? Like uh, somebody cuts us off on the road, we, we turn off the Christianity. Our, our kids, we get in a little battle with our kids, we turn off our Christianity. You know, there's some things that we just kind of like, I'm a Christian up until this point, and then, you know, I, uh, okay. <laughs> Like, you know, it takes one or two times of your kids lipping back to you, and you're like, oh, oh, oh it's on. <laughs> Another verse is James 19, or I'm sorry, 1, 19 through 20. There is no James 19. It's just not that big of a book. James 1, 19 through 20, and it says this. Know this, my beloved brothers, uh, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How does this apply to parenting? <laughs> Have you ever wanted your parent to do the right thing, I mean your, your child to do the right thing, and so you get mad at them and you chew them out and you make this big, huge thing and just kind of, see what I mean? So now let's look at this verse here. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Well, <laughs> that's a little convicting. Um, then um, uh, the verse that goes before that, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Just think about that, and then, then think about your kids, and then, think of, and then ask yourself this question, do I do that? <laughs> I think if we're honest with ourselves, I don't even have to elaborate because you just kind of see what I'm saying. Um, then Ephesians 6, 4 was actually the verse that I was just talking about, about not antagonizing your children. And, you know, this is actually a lot easier to do than, uh, than we realize. Sometimes we get frustrated and we, and we tell them to do something that they can't actually accomplish. Or maybe... Um, 
Let me think of another example. Well, I guess I can come back later if I think of a different example. Uh, verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So th- let's just kind of look at a few things. First off, give your children wins. See what I mean? Sometimes your kids can't do, in- they can't do what's right. Like y- you just hold them to a high standard that's like impossible to achieve, so they can't achieve the thing. You know what I mean? Allow your kids to be able to have a win. You, you kind of get, get what I'm talking about? Like, um, um, you know, like, well, maybe it's just because I'm a perfectionist. But sometimes I expect, you know, perfection out of my kids. You, you can't mess up. You can't ever do the wrong thing. You, you know, the, here's a standard, and you have to excel my expectations of you. And I think that a lot of times we do that with kids. Um, um, and, if, and those of you who know me know that Micah was not the first child that I raised. So if you think that I'm talking about five-year-olds, I'm not. I'm, I have raised children before Micah. So um, I, I, especially when they get into their teenage years, um, they kind of obviously start finding out who they are and start kind of pushing themselves and that kind of stuff. And one of the things that I realized is I got old and I never realized it. <laughs> you, you know, one day you're in high school, you're at the cutting edge of the culture, man. And then one day... Your teenage, your teenager comes home and they start saying stuff, and you're like, everything they do is wrong. Uh, the one I'm talking about was talking about how he st- stayed up till it was four or five in the morning, and I, I had to bite my tongue because I was like, how irresponsible you should, you know, did, did, and I was just like, Ugh. because it wasn't that long ago then, <laughs> that was me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, Ugh. but somewhere along the line, I just got old and I didn't realize it and you know everything he does is wrong and it's like ah ah I suddenly see I suddenly see why all these old old people are mad are mad all the time I get it because they keep doing stupid things just stop doing stupid things (laughs) anyways all right um and then another point that goes along with that is don't break their spirit you know um especially uh some kids are just a little bit more stiff-necked than others uh stubborn strong-willed, whatever you want to say. And your goal is not to break their spirit. Your goal is to direct that. Stubbornness is a good thing. Really, it is. Um, ever seen somebody get to a really, really hard situation in life and endure it? Stubbornness, that's a good thing. The only thing is stubbornness can be directed to a bad thing, too. Like when you insist on your way above somebody else's way, even though your way is wrong. Stubbornness, that's bad. But then you get to a bad situation. I know a lot of, for instance, Marines and stuff, who their stubbornness is what got them through alive. This is, stubbornness is a good thing. It's just it needs to be directed in the right way. And what we do is we try and make, when, uh, we try to make the, the kid that rubs us the wrong way, that we don't naturally, cohe- there's not natural cohesion there, we try and make that one change their character because they rub us the wrong way because that's not our character. And that's just not really the idea there. Like, for instance, Oh, well, I could go on. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just skip that. Uh, and then there's, there's the idea of positive encouragement more than negative encouragement. Like, for instance, spanking, spanking here's, a, here's a good example. A lot of people have different opinions about spanking. I'm not trying to convince you to spank or not to spank. That's completely out of the argument. All that I'm saying is spanking has a very limited um, product that it achieves. Spanking doesn't really tell your kids what to do. It tells them how to not make you mad a lot of times. Because most of the times that, you, that people spank, they, they usually do it within, when they're angry, which is, you know, not a good idea. So the goal isn't to do the right thing, it's to not make you mad. See what I mean? You, you've, you've given them a goal there that's just not really attainable because sometimes you're going to come home in a bad mood. What are they supposed to do with that? <laughs> then your kids have to carry you and put you in a good mood? That's just a bad idea. Um, whereas positive encouragement, let me give you an example. A lot of kids nowadays are extremely lazy, there's just not much expected of them at the house. They come home from school and they sit on in front of the TV all day. Well, that doesn't have to be the case. If you positively encourage a child, they will naturally go where the praise is. They will na- a child will naturally go where the praise is. Um, for instance, if you teach them how to do chores when they're young and praise them for doing a good job and have it as a family activity and don't make them feel stupid when they do it wrong they're going to be more prone to do it. See what I'm getting at? And that's just kind of my point with, with some verses we just kind of skip past 
because it's just not really. <laughs> so some of the verses, some of the words here that I want to look at. Um, it said to in in Ephesians six four. Um, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. But then it says in this second part, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So what what is that? Discipline is to teach. Um, this can be by example or by words, just the idea of instruction, and it can be the idea of correction. Now, that can be by means of discipline or other means. It, it's not really specific. It's more of a broad term. And then the second one that it says there, um, and instruction of the Lord. Instruction basically means counsel or to warn. So we're talking about being intimately involved in your children's lives rather than provoking them. So if you just stop and say, how are those two things at odds, provoking rather than teaching and counseling, you'll quickly come, come to realize where the problem is. Uh, marriage. Here's another thing that we kind of just kind of... Before I even get this, I should just, just kind of give you an example. Um, when I got married, there was something inside of me that just assumed that my wife's profession or whatever should take second seat to my profession. And even though she and I have both been working full-time at the church for years, there was, there was just kind of this assumption that her ministry had to make way for my ministry. So if I'm preparing for my ministry, she just has to kind of deal with it, and then she has to find time in the nights or weekends, I guess, to prepare her ministry. Well... It only took me eight years, and then I figured out, you know, we could work this out where it'd be a lot more time efficient. How about I take the kids, and you get your ministries done, and then you take the kids, and I get my ministries done? Genius. <laughs> I mean, why didn't I think of this before? I don't know. I really don't. But when two people who are married have kids and both work full-time at the church, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea to expect one of them to just kind of take care of everything while you, you know, that's just not going to work. I mean, unless you want them to step down from the ministry. But So a few verses that I think we kind of ignore when it comes to uh, relationships. Is Galatians 5, 22 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ... Uh, Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That uh, should obviously make you ask this question. With the relationships in my life, can I honestly say that I have, what does it say there in verse 24, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires? Am I living for my passions or am I putting my passions to death? <laughs> let, I mean, let, let's, let's, let's really look at this here. I know a lot of times... Um, I'll give you an example. I, somebody wanted me to do something. I said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my wife and get back to you. And they said, oh, be a man. So making a decision that affects your wife behind her back is being a man? Eh, eh. <laughs> Another thing, when I, when I was young, I was told that being a man was, you know, losing your temper and throwing things and that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> That's being a child in a man's body. That's what that is. <laughs> uh, this is what actually being a man is right here. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Now, we read through those things and we say, well, that was a long list, and we don't, we don't really stop and look at the individual things. So let's look at the individual things. Uh, okay, so the first thing is love. Now, in our culture, love is kind of something that we emphasize feeling on, right? If I feel like it, then that's love. So we can fall in and out of love because love is just this emotion that comes and goes. But the biblical idea of love is more of an action, it's something where you don't feel like it, <laughs> and you still do it. And uh, so that's, that's the first thing there, love, love being an action. And then uh, we're going to look at a, another verse that kind of breaks that down a little bit more. But um, second off, not competing. And you might say, oh, well, that's kind of should be obvious. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Competition in marriage is very common. Who's more spiritual? <laughs> Who does more at church? <laughs> Who brings home the bread? I mean, it's just a constant competition for a lot of, for in a lot of different cases. Um, and it doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be. Um, but if we look at these things, we see that, that these things are not coherent or congruent with these things. For instance, if I'm, if I'm being peaceable to my spouse, that means that I am creating, sp I'm creating peace when there is no peace, right? That means if my wife is irritated, it's not she's just being stubborn and da 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 it's my job as a man to create peace in that situation, right? Doesn't this make sense? 
There's a lot of times that we read the Bible and we say, hey, this, I'm not going to apply it, when there's just a better way to do life. Um, another thing here, you know, a lot of times we get ourselves into problems and we don't have the wisdom to get, the, to get out of it because we refuse to change how we're living. Did you know that? Did you know that a lot of our problems are because of our own stubbornness? We're, we're spiting ourselves or smiting our, ourselves. Did, did you know that? Sometimes, especially as we get older, this is incredibly easier, easy to do. In, in my teens, it wasn't a big deal. You know, you just stopped doing it. But once I hit my 20s, something changed, and I started getting real stubborn about my way or the highway. And I'm looking at people who are older than me, and they're saying that it just gets worse. And I'm just like, well, <laughs> thanks for clarifying that. Um, but then some other things that are, that are here. Gentleness. When you deal with, the, with your, not just your spouse, this applies to other people too. Are you being gentle or are you being rash? Um, so then, uh, no outbursts of anger. <laughs> you're going to get mad at people. It's going to happen. If you're in a church for longer than any amount of time, somebody will irritate you in the church. Do not answer that with outbursts of anger. <laughs> be gentle. Be patient. Be a peacemaker. That's just a good example there. Um, st uh, sticking through the problem. There, there's something that happens, uh, specifically in marriage, there's something that happens where your spouse needs to know that you're not just throwing in the towel. Your spouse just needs to know that. No matter how you feel, you don't ever, ever, ever say the word divorce. You let them know that you're in it for the long run. If, any, if anybody gets divorced, let it be your spouse's fault. They're the ones who bring it up. You try and resolve it. You try and do your best to, because I guarantee you, people say it takes two people to do a marriage. That's just not overly true. It takes one person giving 100% effort, because this is what happens. The husband will try really, really hard. The wife won't. And then the wife will try really, really hard, and the husband won't. It's this constant back and forth. And marriages survive that way. <laughs> Ideally, it would be two people giving 100%, but that's never going to happen. So what's going to happen is you're going to have to carry your spouse for the times that they can't stand you. <laughs> that's hard because <laughs> when they don't when they can't stand you you're gonna th say well i don't really like you either but you still have to be patient gentle see what i mean these things w these only apply if me and my wife are not in a fight uh okay because <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> okay um and then not saying things to tear you, kn you know you know your spouse better than anybody and you know the little things that can get under their skin. And you know their little insecurities, and you can bring them up real good. I know I was just talking about men here. I'm talking about women here, too. In fact, women are masters at this. See, they figured out a long time ago that a fist fight wouldn't end well. So instead, they see these little things that, that the guy don't, doesn't even realize what has been done. But somewhere in the argument, a TNT bomb has been placed underneath their skin, and they don't even know it's there. And they're like, ha I won that fight. I won it. And then they get home, and they start thinking. And then the, those little things that she said, they start, oh, oh, this is not going well. And it starts tearing down your confidence. And you're like, man, I thought I won that battle. And so then you're all on edge because you're like, oh, she said that. And does she know? Does she know that that's my, my week? Does she know? And so then you start going crazy, and you're all sitting there at night all, Ugh, and you look over at her, and she's asleep. And it's like, oh, oh. Oh, well, I'll show her. I'll fart. Ha, ha, ha. You know, and, and just kind of stupidity triumphing stupidity. But I think out of all of these things, a verse that really, um, a verse that really kind of summarizes all these things is found in, in Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, which is the very next book. Or, I'm sorry, after Ephesians, I guess. Sorry, my book was on Ephesians. Um, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, it says this. Now, this is a verse that, once again, applies to a lot of things in life, but we just refuse to apply it to our lives. It says here, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do you know how many conflicts would be completely resolved by just following that one verse? I will read it again. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. That would resolve like 100% of your conflicts. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay. So this is a good example of this would be not expecting your spouse to surrender themselves when you don't. 
You have to surrender your goals for my goals. You have to surrender your dreams for my dreams. It's okay if I go out and spend foolishly and don't consult you, but you better not spend money behind my back because it's my money. I earned it. You have to run everything to me, but I don't have to run anything to you. How is that a healthy environment? How is that a healthy environment? When, when, just in case you didn't know, when you get married, your, your money is not your money anymore. It became your married account money. It doesn't matter who owns it, who earned it. It is now y'all's money. That's how that works. And uh, what, pro what happens is we try and keep ourselves separate in different areas. We each have our own bank account. We each have our own room where we sleep. And then there's no cohesion in the marriage, and we wonder why. Because we have a bunch of little areas that we've segregated ourselves with. Um, so this doesn't, I'm not just talking about sex here. Obviously, sex is a big issue whenever you're talking about marriage. It's going to be usually the guy wants it all the time and the girl doesn't. That's not always the case, but usually that's the case. And uh, I'm not talking about, about, you know, that. But I will say this. Instead of demanding it from your, from your spouse all the time, try being sensitive to what they need instead of to what you need. And you'd be surprised. And I'm talking about men and women both here. Be sensitive to what your spouse needs, and you'd be surprised how the atmosphere of your home will change. And you and your spouse will both start parenting different, too. That's, that's something that's just true. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm also talking about life in general. About, you know, those verses that I read. So now let's, let's, let's look at a few more verses. We're almost done. I don't want to keep you here all night. Um, well, I do want to keep you here all night, but I think you might get frustrated and leave. So, I won't. Um, okay, so some things about in life. 1 Corinthians 13. Now, everybody knows... Everybody knows the love chapter. Um, you see people quote this when they're getting married. You see this, you know, on, printed on portrait things. And, but once again, this is yet another verse that we don't really apply. <laughs> uh, first off, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through, 4 through 8. I'll read it in just a second. But this verse is actually talking about the use of the gifts in, the, in church. That when you are used in the different gifts, prophecy, and those different things, that this is the way they should be done. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not uh, arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now, if the church would act like that, <laughs> uh, people wouldn't be wronged in the church. Um, but... Uh, how does this apply to how you treat people in the church or how you treat your coworkers? You know, we're called to make peace at work, too. Once again, remember that switch I said that we turned the whole Christian thing on and off? <laughs> okay, I'll be Christian at church, but when I get around my coworkers, eh, it's off. <laughs> I'm going to talk about things that I shouldn't. I'm going to do things that I shouldn't. And uh, I'm going to have attitudes that I shouldn't. I mean... <laughs> It's a lot harder to be a Christian if you compartmentalize. You know what that is? That's where this is your Christian box, and you, and you wear, this, wear this box when you're at church. And then when you're home, you wear a different box. That's called compartmentalizing. You're being a different person at different times of your life. That actually makes it harder to be a Christian. You would think it would be easier because you only have to play Christian every once in a while. But it actually makes it harder because all your thoughts get jumbled. <laughs> and then you start thinking things that you shouldn't, and, and you forget which crowd you're around, and then you're like, oh, oh, I shouldn't have said that around this person. So, I mean, you just kind of get your, get your boxes confused. Um, but anyways, so when you're dealing with, uh, with, with, with co-workers or with people in the church, love is patient, Okay. So, so you're, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to show love to people. Okay, all right. So what is that? Well, it's being patient. It's being kind with them. Once again, love in the Bible is the idea of action, not the idea of feeling. If you've been married, you know that love is not a feeling. <laughs> if you've had kids, you know that love is not a feeling. <laughs> uh, there's sometimes you want to strangle them. And, uh, but anyways, uh, love does not envy or boast. So, <laughs> oh boy. If you just... I'm just going to tell you, go home and, re and read that and just think about that and then see how it applies to your marriage and to your life and to the people you deal with in church. And uh, 
if, if you feel a little bit convicted, um, pay attention to that, and I'll just skip past it. Uh, so how should we handle, uh, you know, okay, if somebody's doing this, that, or the other thing, you know, how do we handle issues with uh, political views? How do we handle issues with um, moral views and, and the culture and all kinds of different stuff? Well, let me just read a verse that I think would um, have a lot to say about that. John thirteen thirty five says this, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So whatever issue you're talking about, there needs to be love shown in it. And once again, this is another area that we kind of turn off the whole Christian thing. I'm Christian until we talk about politics. Then it's all, you know, all hell breaks loose. Here comes out the boxing gloves and whatever area we're talking about, whether we're talking about gun control or whether we're talking about you know, other amendment rights, or whether we're talking about political views, they will know that you're a Christian by your love. Okay, I'm not telling you to not have views on stuff. I'm telling you to just handle that conversation like you can imagine Jesus having handled that situation. So then some of you jokers are saying, so chasing people with a whip is, I can do that? So somewhere in here, somebody always says something along the lines of this. If I love them, I'll speak the truth. And of course, the truth is your view. And of course, the truth is always said with a nasty little attitude. So let's look at a few verses that completely contradict that idea. Proverbs 15.2. And honestly, we could say verses all day, so I'm not going to. I just limited it to like, I don't know, five or six or something. Uh, 15.2, the tongue of the wise commends knowledge or, or makes knowledge acceptable or makes it easy to um, understand the wisdom. Um, but, the mouths of, uh, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. So when you're talking to people, do you make knowledge acceptable to them? Do you say it in such a way where they can understand it and they can, they can accept it? Or do you say it in such a way purposely to try to antagonize them? You know, I guess I'm just naive, but I was talking to somebody... And did you know that they were tra- saying stuff purposely to try and irritate me? Did you know that people do that? Man, this was like, oh, whoa, really? I assumed that if you talk to somebody with respect, that they will talk to you with respect. That's not true, okay? <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> However, once again, that doesn't excuse me from doing what's right. So 1518 says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. Are you quieting contention, or are you just making sure your own point is heard? Because the and Proverbs also says this. It says that, that a fool rushes for other pe- to, uh, to give people his opinion, but he doesn't listen to other people. So then uh, chapter 20, verse 3. Proverbs is just a good book to be reading. Says, And you know what the thing is? Sometimes people say, I just don't get anything from the Bible. I don't see how it applies to me. Proverbs is like the most applicable book in, in the world. I mean, it's just super easy to get something out of it. Uh, it is an honor for a man to keep aloof from strife. <laughs> I like that word, aloof. <laughs> but every fool will be quarreling. Every fool enters into a quarrel. But it's, it's, it's wisdom to just kind of eh, keep yourself from that. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 2 Timothy 2, 23-24. Okay, right here. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. Did you guys hear that? Who's on Facebook? Anybody? Yeah? Okay. All right. I'll read that one again then. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. I know you guys have made this mistake. I've made this mistake. I know you have too. <laughs> You know that they breed quarrels. They do? What? And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. Wow, patiently enduring evil. Wow. Go back, go back on your browsing history for the, ne- for the last two or three weeks and ask yourself, was I patiently enduring evil or was I shooting up my mouth? Because I know that I'm not the only one who's made big stupid mistakes on Facebook. Okay, so here's three points of departure. Three points that are going to separate you from everyone around you. Okay? The first two are not important. Let it go. The last one is the only one 
that is worth separation, okay? Now, once again, though, separation with a good attitude. Okay, so I'll, I'll elaborate that a little bit more. But the first one is difference of character. Some people are, are shy, some people are not. So, you know, on one side saying, you have to be just like me, you have to be shy, you have to be non-confrontational. Non Change of character. Some people are more in your face as their character, not necessarily being saying stuff rude, I'm not saying that. But some people are just more, my mom calls them northerners. I don't know. You call them whatever you want. I don't know. Whatever. And, uh, or, you know, or being the other side, you have to be a people person like me. You have to be out there in the rat race. You know, you have to, you have to, you know, ah, well, some people like me just like to be left alone in their office with a book. <laughs> and that's okay. You don't have to be like me, and I don't have to be like you. That's okay. Um, another, uh, this difference of character that also applies to race. Sometimes people prejudge people because of their skin color, or because of their ethnic background. Um, I don't think I have to say anything more about that. You guys know what I'm talking about. That, that's not something that should actually matter. Um, the second uh, point of departure, a difference of opinion. Republican versus Democrat, your stance on gun control, uh, your stance on the Holy Spirit being Baptist or Pentecostal or whatever, women being in ministry, these kinds of things, where you have your own opinion. That's fine. That's fine. Here's the thing about the church, okay? It doesn't have to be a Republican or Democrat. Really, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be um, a white church. It doesn't have to be a black church. It doesn't have to be a church where we all, you know, have guns and believe that everybody should have guns, or it shouldn't be one of those church and one of those things where we all think that gun control. There should allow for the difference of opinion. The church should not be limited by difference of opinion. Really, it shouldn't. The church of the Bible is something where Jesus had this idea, crazy I know, that we could all be united around a bigger vision than politics. A bigger vision, something beyond us, beyond our opinions. And it was this, the kingdom of God. That was supposed to be the, 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 the point of, of, of unity. And instead, we've made it a thing where, you know, we have our white churches and our black churches. We have our Republican churches, and they, they're the ones that hang the American flag in the back, and you better be a, a blood-bought American Christian. And, you know, it just... Eh. Then there's the other ones who are all like, Democrats are going... Jesus was a Democrat, not a Republican. It's like... Uh, really, we can't reduce the gospel to these things. We really can't. These are the first two points of departure, and they really shouldn't be points that make it where you cannot be a part of the same body. So then the third, the third point of departure, the only difference that should actually matter, a difference of morality. I'll give you a good example. A couple years back, there was this whole nonsense about kneeling for the national anthem or some nonsense like that. A lot of people had a lot of different, uh, different opinions. And here's the, thing, here's the thing that I wanted to focus in on. There were a lot of Christians who were calling other Christians, saying that they were not Christians for not sharing their same view. What does that have to do with accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? It's okay to have an opinion. That's all right. Totally fine. But remember that our salvation is not dependent on our politics or on gun control or on anything else. And it's okay that other people have different views than you. It's okay. Really, it is. Somehow, we've lost, in, in, our, in our culture, we've lost the ability to be okay with other people having different views than us. Somewhere we've lost that. It's like if somebody it doesn't agree with me, they're just, they're just an idiot. Um, I hate to quote her, but I will. <laughs> Ellen DeGeneres showed this fantastically. She went to uh, some kind of game. I forgot what it was, and she was sitting next to ex-President Bush, um, the younger junior. And uh, a lot of her fans, oh, they threw a fit, and she said, hold on. Yes, we have different views, but we're still friends. And that was so refreshing so refreshing. <laughs> that is just, that is exactly, exactly what I'm saying. Um, anyways, so a difference in morality. Can you worship God and other gods? This is something that, that's important. Some people believe that, yes, you can mix the two, and the Bible says no. So that's something that's worth, that's worth uh, looking at. Is it wrong to use Ouija boards? This is another thing that's worth looking at. Um, is truth relative or is there an absolute truth? This is something that's worth knowing. Um, is the Bible God's word? These are all things that I hope you see. Differences in morality like that are, are, really, are really important. I wouldn't advise 
having too close of friends that have drastic difference of morality standards um, because it will start to rub off on you. However, as Paul said, good company corrupts bad morals. But I, I, I don't want to say, you know, get out of the world. I'm not saying that at all. But And uh, with the church, the only thing that really should matter is morality. Morality. That God is the way to salvation and that his standard is, is the rule. That's the one that should, that should really be important to us. Now, if somebody doesn't agree with you on morality, once again, be nice, be polite, <laughs> be loving, be patient, be kind, all those things. And, uh, you know, don't try and tell them, you know, hey, you need to get out of the church and everything because if it's an issue, it will be dealt with. But usually it's not an issue. Usually it's something that will work itself out. This is, this is what I'm getting at. Do you have to be a Christian before we welcome you. This is, what the, this is what the Romans tried to do. You have to convert before we will welcome you. And that didn't work real well. But then St. Patrick had this revolutionary idea, and he started saying, okay, instead of that, you are welcome to fellowship with me. He rubbed shoulders with them. And this started a massive revival in Ireland, and uh, he was able to grow the church fantastically, the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church tried to go in and, and fix his method, going back to the whole, you have to be like us before we'll accept you, and ministry corbluted. <laughs> See, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, people can't possibly experience the truth if you won't let them experience the truth. There's more that could be said about that, but I think that 810 is good enough. So we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, can, I, uh, can I get uh, Ricky to close us in prayer, please?